morning, everyone. What a great day to be back in this room. It's getting comfortable, isn't it? Let's stand together. We're going to sing. We're going to worship. Let's, let me tell you, it's Christmas time, right? Let's talk about the Christmas time. Oh, there we go. Let's, <laughs> our music that has come to us through all these years, the Christmas carols that we love. Let's talk about one of them today, Joy to the World. We're going to sing a song today called Joy to the World, Joyful, Joyful. We know these songs, but how they got to us is amazing. Over 300 years ago in 17, uh, 17, I wrote it down, 1719, a man named Isaac Watts, a prolific songwriter, wrote over 750 hymns. He wrote a poem. It wasn't a song. He wrote a poem called Joy to the World. In 1836, an American took that song and he put it with music from Handel's Messiah and published it around Christmas time because that song that was written by Isaac Watts, I'm sorry, the poem written by Isaac Watts was a poem about the second coming of Jesus from Psalm 98. But when uh, uh, Mr. Lowell took it in 1836, he took it, he put music with the song, he published it at Christmas time and Joy to the World became a Christmas song that people love and know today. There's another song in, uh, what is it, eight, 1907. Uh, Henry Van Dyke took that song and he wrote a song called uh, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee, God of Glory, Lord of Love. Then in, uh, let's see, 19, oh, I have to cheat, I'm sorry, 1907 he did that and he wrote that song that we know today. In 2019, okay, we're almost up to us now, right? A man that we know, we know a lot of his songs, some of us do, Phil Wickham. He took the song, Joy to the World. He took the song, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. He put them together into this song that we're singing here today. It took 300 years for us to sing this song that we're singing here today. Joy to the World was written by Isaac Watts from Psalm 98. Let's look at Psalm 98 and read these words out loud together. Now, this song is a loud song, and it's meant to be because it's based on Psalm 98. So read this out loud, very loud, with me, everyone all together. Ready? Make a joyful noise unto the Lord all the earth. Make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. Sing unto the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of a psalm. With trumpets and sound of cornets, make a joyful noise before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. That's our song, Joy to the World. Let's sing it together. You know this, sing out now, really. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing.
Amen. Amen. We're going to continue singing here, and uh, we've got a, a song called Behold uh, that I want to tell you about here in just a moment. You can, you can go ahead and take a seat. I promise I won't be too long. I know when you say go ahead and take a seat, it's like, uh-oh. But I won't be too long. I promise I'll be as quick as I can be. We're going to sing this song, Behold. But before we do, I just want to say welcome to church. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, it's, it's exciting to be in this room. It feels so tight, so close. Uh, I love being able to hear everybody singing all together. Uh, it's so fun being in here. If you, if you're, if you haven't uh, checked in for worship yet, we'd love to ask you to, to go ahead and do that. Uh, you can do that in the Church Center app or by scanning the QR code that's on the seat in front of you. And uh, we would just love for you to do that. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, it just lets us know that you're here. And two, uh, because you get an opportunity to submit any prayer requests that you might have there. We meet on a weekly basis and we pray through those things uh, for you. It's officially the Christmas season, right? Uh, anybody excited about Christmas time? Yeah, okay, a few of you good. I am pretty excited about Christmas. Uh, how many of you still have a ton of Christmas shopping to do? Anybody not done any Christmas shopping yet? Oh, a couple of you, wow. Uh, my wife and I, we are, we're very ahead of the game, mainly because um, I don't think we pay full price for anything ever. And so we're like looking for deals all year long, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're about 90% done already. So we're, we're on top of things. We're, we're ahead of the, the game a little bit there. Uh, so for those of you who haven't done any shopping, you might want to start at least thinking about it because Christmas is coming, coming very soon. Uh, we're going to sing this song, Behold. That, that word, Behold, it doesn't just mean to, to look at something. It means to give, give special attention. It's as if I were to say, hey, everybody stop what you're doing, everything, no distractions, nobody looking anywhere other than what I'm telling you to behold. All attention is diverted to the thing that we are beholding. That's what it means to behold. The word behold is used a few times in scripture and I wanna look at just a few of those before we sing this song. Uh, in Luke chapter 2, verse 10 through 11, it says, And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold. Don't, don't look at anything else. Look at this. Give all your attention to this. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 29, uh, has John the Baptist is the person speaking here. He's the one uh, who, who was the messenger. He was the one who paved the way for Jesus to come, going and telling people, hey, there's a Savior that's coming. He says this, the next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, behold. Everybody stop what you're doing. Look, everybody, divert, divert all attention to this moment right here. Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. The one who came to pay the debt that we couldn't pay. The one who came and took all of our sins upon himself. 1 John 3, 1 says this. Behold, pay special attention, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knows us not because it knew him not. Today, what we have the opportunity to do is to behold, to behold Jesus, the one who deserves all the glory, the one who deserves all the praise. That's what this whole Christmas season is about, is, is to stop, to, to behold, to give special attention to what it's really all about. And so we're going to sing this song. A part of it says, he deserves all the glory. He deserves all of it, all of it. Nothing distracting us. We're giving all of the glory to him and to him alone. So would you stand with me? We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing this song. Dear God, we love you, and I thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here and the, the, the chance, the privilege that we have today to intentionally behold you, to, to get distractions out of our minds, to be focused on you and on what you've done. God, help us to behold you today. And it's in Jesus' name I pray.
of you were asking last week, are we going to sing traditional Christmas songs? Here you go. I expect to hear you. Come on. It's okay if we read from the Bible, amen? amen. There's, uh, we love the uh, stories of Christmas time. There's something about them that makes you feel warm and comfortable and happy and very familiar. But they're real. The story that we read in Matthew 2 of the wise men that came to seek out Jesus. It's remarkable how they came to even know what was going on. They were from so far away. They were from that area of Babylon that you read about in uh, the book of Daniel. The story about the Savior would come was told by the Jews that were in captivity at that time. And they, that story was faithfully passed down among those Persian people until that day, at that time, where they saw that star. And those men that were watching that and studying that carefully said, oh, my goodness, it's happening now. And they went off on their journey after uh, to find that newborn king. It took them a while. By the time they had gotten to where Jesus was, it, he wasn't in the manger. His family had 
was living in a house. Jesus was probably about two years old. And so these men went to that house and to a little toddler boy. This is what happened. Let's read these verses out loud together. Would you read Matthew 2, verse 10 with us? When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped. The worship that we know began with a little baby at Christmas. Let's worship him together. that our world really celebrates, yet we know the reason, because you sent your son, Jesus. We thank you for the stories we hear this time of year, no matter how many times we have heard them, we never tire of them, we are so grateful. We thank you for the Savior that you sent for us. We thank you for the ability to worship you among God's people. Thank you so much for allowing us to meet like this. What a great thing it is to raise our voices together. Worship, to feel the love we all have for you and our church. We thank you for the preaching. We thank you for our Bibles. I pray that you would help us to listen carefully to what you would have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Amen. Boy, it's good to see you guys today. Love being here. I love the Christmas season. I love the songs. Uh, I, I, have any of you saw the pictures that I posted of what the sanctuary looks like? If you saw those, okay. It is, it's getting a little goggly before it gets better, okay. Uh, we're tearing out all the, the concrete and the block and then doing all that. It's a lot of uh, tearing it out to get ready for what's about to come in. And so it's all happening right now. 
And so I love this space. I love the fact that God gave us this a number of years ago, uh, just knew that we would need it for a time like this. And so it's great to have you in person. It's great to have people watching online. And uh, I, I, I've had a number of instances. I ran into three situations in the past week and a half where people told me I never miss a week of uh, watching online because they're shut-ins in different situations like that. And I know of one circumstance, we've got a young man named Eli uh, that watches uh, right now. His schedule got changed, and I found out that he works at Firestone, and, and, and while the, he's watching right now from Firestone, so we say shout-out to Eli, and he turns the church service on in the, uh, in, the, in the garage where they're working, and they watch it together, so they're having church in the garage. But you know what that is? That's church because it's wherever God is at. And so we say hi to Eli and the guys and uh, thank them for joining us online. And uh, for everybody, uh, whether you're online or in person, let's take our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 30. Uh, we're getting to the bottom of the chapter. We're talking about faith. We're not talking about the faith of other people. We're talking about the faith of the other people that God says, watch what I did through them so that you can do it. Our, our whole thing is, the Bible explains that we're to live by faith. God wants us to take steps of faith. God wants us to be changed by faith. God wants us to be moved by faith. So important for us to get the point of this, that God's challenging us. I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. We will never see great moves of God if we don't take great steps of faith. So, like, man, I wish God would do what he did there. You know why God did that? Because they stepped out on faith to do something. They trusted God when nothing made sense. They moved forward when they were afraid. They, they put God first in all of their circumstances. They, they lived sacrificial life. They, gave a, they, they, they lived obedient. When God told Noah, build an ark. God, I, I've never done that before, but I trust you. If we're not going to be moved by faith, we're never going to see God do great things. So man, this world needs Jesus. He does. And I want to prove to you today that God works through our faith. The Bible says, and we started with this, and I want to remind you why we're doing this. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you're going to please God, it cannot happen without faith. The Bible doesn't just say that it's complicated. It's impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible. Let me put it like this. If you are not growing in your faith, then you are not where God wants you to be. And I'm not being mean. But if we get comfortable, and I, I even challenge you in your life, in, in this past week, for Christians and people that are here, even if you're not a believer and you're watching or listening right now, I, I promise you today's message is for you. Because faith is constantly going, uh, taking steps towards God. Faith is constantly getting out of your comfort zone. And for Christians that have grown up with these stories and grown up with the word of God and we know these things, but we're not living these things, then we're not where God wants us to be. God pushes us into areas of our life that are going to be uncomfortable. And that's what every story is that we've read through this. So God is building their faith. And I want to give you another example of this today. <clears throat> every story, an example is how God works. So we, I, I Last week we talked about Moses. Now we're going to jump forward like tons of years. Okay, so, and, and that's what Hebrews does. Hebrews just goes through and highlights these different stories, these different acts of faith. He says, let, 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 me, let me tell you about uh, Abel. And now let me tell you about Noah. And let me tell you about Jacob. Because every one of us is different. And we're going to come across different circumstances. And God wants to say, teaching us, I work through all of those crazy things by faith. Faith is moving forward when nothing makes sense. Faith is putting God first. Faith is choosing to walk with God. That's what faith is. They come to the Red Sea. We study that. They get to the other side. They wander through the wilderness, have all sorts of ups and downs. Moses dies. Joshua takes over. They come to the Jordan River. God holds back the water. They come to the other side. And they come to Jericho. And we know the story of Jericho. I love the story of Jericho. This story is not the story of Jericho. It is, but it's not. It's what makes it so cool. It's, it, it's, it's the story of Jericho. But let, let me read it. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they were compassed about seven days. And you're like, Pastor Tony, that's definitely about Jericho. <laughs> Let's get into it. There's a couple of things that we're not understanding yet. I love the story of Jericho. And if you were here a number of months ago when we were back in the sanctuary, I preached on this story. 
And I was talking about faith from the different perspective, but it's interesting to me how God brought them smack up to the wall. It's, it's like they come up to this situation, and it is huge, and it's massive, and the Bible talks about the structure of it and how big it was and how they were chariots on the outside of it. All these things are happening, and God was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something with this, but he brought them right up to it. As they walked around Jericho, they could literally put their hand out and, 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 and touch the walls. It was It was massive. The weird thing about this story is they walked around it seven days. And the question is, why? You talk about a waste of time. It, it, let, me, let me read it again. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed, after they walked about it seven days. Why seven days? Now I'll ask you guys the question. Did God need seven days? Was God just moving slow? Was he like, man, let's, let's take another crack at this thing tomorrow? And I talked about how, how the, it wasn't about what God was doing in the walls of Jericho. It was about what God was doing in them. Think about this. Just be real. They come home. All the men, they walk around, all the trumpets, and they, you, know, you know the story of what they did. And they come home and say, honey, how did it go? It's like, did you feel the wall shake? No, nothing. I mean, did you see any cracks in the wall? I mean, was something happened? No, 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 honey, no, nothing. I mean, you, you had to see at least one brick fall. No, honey, nothing happened today. Nothing. Then why do you keep walking? Why do you have to get up every day and walk around your problem and stare at your problem and look at your problem when there's nothing you can do about your problem? Man, it's a powerful story. But can we just look at this again? We're going to get into the next verse, but we're not there yet. By faith. It wasn't just about walking. He's walking by faith. God has me circling this monstrosity of a, of a city. God has me walking around this for a reason. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. But the next word is everything. After. After they were compassed about seven days. See, God wants us to take the steps of obedience, and we want the walls to fall right now. And God says, I'm not done. You know what the number seven was? The number seven was the number of completion. God was like, I'm not done working in you yet. Every day when you're circling on that problem and you're staring up and saying, this is so overwhelming, God says, do it again. I want you to obey me. I want you to trust me. It wasn't about God working on the wall. It was God working in their hearts. Some of you are on day four and day five, and I know I'm just re-preaching what I preached a few months ago, and I know that. But some of you are just like, man, I'm so tired. Honey, I got to go walk around the walls today. Man, my knees hurt, my legs, my feet are so sore. It's like, what do I have to do? I'm just going to obey God. I'm just going to do it because God said to do it. That's, that's what faith is. Faith is trusting God when nothing makes sense. Faith is keep moving forward on day four, day five, day six, because they would have never seen the walls drop if they would have quit on day six. That's not the story. Do you know what's weird about this? Let me read it again. This is weird. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they were compassed about seven days. There's no name. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. By faith, Jacob. By faith, you know, all the faith of these different. Who's the faith? It's like there's no name. How are we going to understand the faith of somebody? Because Hebrews 11 is about to drop one of the biggest bombs, one of the biggest surprises in, in all of the Bible is about to happen right here. Listen to it. Next verse. Here's the faith. You ready for this? By faith, the harlot. You're like, oh, okay. Like, well, how'd she get in this passage? Yeah, before you even say, oh, it's probably just somebody that struggled with something. No, she was a sex worker. She sold her body for money. She was a prostitute. We try to water down these things, you know, it's like, she wasn't that bad. It wasn't this. No, she was, she was messed up. Hey, hey, the, the, the Greek word for this is pornos. It's the word where we get the, our word today of pornography. She literally lived a lifestyle of sexual sin, lust, and fornication. And then we look at this and go, what in the world? Like, you're, you're going to compare her to Abraham? You're going to put her on the same level as Noah? He built an ark and saved people and rescued literally mankind as a result of his faith. And now you've got this harlot? 
by faith the harlot, Rahab, perished not with them that believed not, when she received the spies with peace. What is the lesson here? Why is she in the hall of faith? You guys ready for this? Because faith is trusting that God can completely change your life. She's introduced as a prostitute. But if you were to go back to Hebrews 11 too, when we get into the stories of everything that's going on, you know how the begin, and this is going back a number of weeks now that we started this, for by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. So when we get to the New Testament, we're looking back at her life. I'm not talking about her sin and her issues and her problems and her lifestyle and her reputation. I'm talking about if you get to the New Testament, when God says, let me tell you about the elders, the heroes of the faith, those that walked the walk and did the job. Let me tell you about those that lived out of faith. And I'm going to take you to Enoch and Abraham and Noah, and Moses and Jacob and Isaac and all these, Joseph and all these people. And God says, yes, Rahab, because she's not who she used to be. What a powerful story. You know, she's the last story story that we read before we get into the list of the other people. Here's the point. How in the world? Here's the lesson. God can change anyone. I, I think there, there's two parts to this, and I'm going to explain this as we got. And have we gotten to the point where we think that there's some people here that think that you cannot change? I've tried to do Christian life. I show up to church. I try to do this thing. But if anybody knew that I have issues behind the scenes, I have addictions behind the scenes. I have problems that I struggle with. I, I have sin of the mind, sin of the flesh, sin, sin of uh, my past. All these things, I'm stuck in a rut. I'm not the dad that I need to be. I'm on the verge of losing my spouse. I can't change. You understand that that is a lie. If God can change the harlot, God can change anyone. I think maybe if it's you, you're stuck in that lifestyle. You have that reputation I, I, I think that sometimes we struggle with that, but I think sometimes it's the flip side of that, that maybe in our minds there's other people that we know that God cannot change. It's true. You have that relative that, you, man, I've witnessed to them. They're, they're, so, they're so brainwashed. They're so strung out on drugs. They've been an alcoholic as long as I've known them. They're a thief. I, I, don't, I don't turn my back on that guy or that lady, whatever. And I'm not the, I don't want to raise of hands, but I'm telling you, for a lot of us, there are people, I'm telling you, that we've written off. Maybe it's somebody that's watching online right now that you feel like you're that person that doesn't even deserve to be here right now, that maybe God's written you off. We struggle with this. Now, we don't say that. Oh, we're too holy to do that. Like I'll get up on Sunday morning and say, God can save anybody. Amen. Praise God. You'll get in the car and hey, so-and-so called, what do they want this time? Man, they're such a mooch. Man, I'll tell you what, I've been dealing with them my whole life, and I, you know, no, nothing's the mindset of, man, I believe that God's working in their life and God wants to save them. No, we've written them off in our minds. So remember, they just crossed over the Jordan River. They come to Jericho, and Joshua sends in these two spies. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two spies secretly saying, go view the land, even Jericho. And they went, and they came into the harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. So this was not just, and I, I just want to reiterate this. This is not something that their Bible is just saying, well, she had a past. The Bible's not saying she had struggles. You know, I'm, I'm, I try to be a good person, and I attend the local church, and I do this, but I have problems. No, her house was a, <laughs> she was not a good girl. It's what she did. Prostitution is how she made her money. Her, her, her lodge, her house, her, her place where she was, was known for this in the city. Here she is. She's living in a pagan city with pagan gods, and she's the queen of seduction. She's the one, if you went in the city and asked the other women around, it's like, man, we hate that girl. All she does is ruin marriages. You know how many women have found out that she's been the one that my, their husband was sleeping with? All this. That is the kind of reputation that she had. She was known for this. We see people and think in, their, in our minds that they don't care, that God's done with them, or they just have crossed the line. Have you ever thought maybe sometimes people just cross the line and just think that God, man, it's just, it, we, we write them off in this way. 
The Bible says, and then when they came into Harlot's house named Rahab, then they lodged there. The, the, the lodging there, and I tried to look that up because, I mean, let's just be honest. If these ambassadors of God walk in, I mean, I don't think this was the type of house they should have been staying at. But it was some sort of like hotel. It was kind of like an inn. And it was double, it was kind of like maybe we'd think of today like a massage parlor or whatever, you know. I mean, there was like, <laughs> you think I'm crazy, a lot of you are thinking, he should not be talking this way in church. <laughs> this is how far the Bible takes it. It's not me. And I, I think as long as we think that God has this line, it's like, there's, there's messed up people, but man, there's messed up people, you know. Notice this, verse 2, and it was told that the king of Jericho said, Behold, there came men hither that night, and the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, say, Bring forth the men and come out of thee, and they are entered into thy house, for they come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and, thus, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wish not whence they were. And the, and the verses go on describing how she's over there lying about how they're, they went somewhere else. And she even says, you better hurry up and go get them before they get too far away. So imagine this, okay. Here's these two prophets of God. There are these two spies, and they had to be in some position, some spiritual position to be trusted to do this job. And, and, and they come in here, and you can imagine, they're hiding in this room, and they're thinking, dude, we're done. We're going to die. We're in enemy territory. They're after us. And he's like, are she out there lying? You, I mean, I think in that situation, you'd be like, yes, no, that's bad. Like, yes, she's, you know, what would you do? You know, it's like, this is not the right thing to do. I, 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 she's, she's just doing what she knows to do. First of all, it probably came very natural for her to hide men. I mean, that's just part of her, what her job was, is, is sneaking around and being deceive, uh, 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 deceitful in that way and deceiving other people and deceiving other women. And then she's just lying through her teeth like it was a natural thing to do. Can I point this out? We talk about God can save anyone. She was literally living in sin. It's not that she was struggling with sin. It's not her past. She's living in sin. And she was messed up. She knew she was messed up. It's not a matter of her struggling with sin. I, I think it's important for anybody here that's struggling with sin, you need to know this, that God loves you like crazy. There's so much spiritual warfare that goes out in our hearts and minds when it comes to us living in sin that God doesn't care about us or we have to earn because we put God's love on our love level. If you just start doing better, then maybe you can come over for Thanksgiving. But until you straighten up your life, that's just not going to happen. You know, we, we, we struggle with that. We struggle with people that struggle. We struggle trusting people. We write people off. We do all those things. And so I think when it comes to God's love, sometimes we put God's love on the level of our love, but God's love is not on our level. The Bible says when we're talking about the love of God and how he cares for us, <clears throat> but God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let me read it again. God demonstrated, God commended, God showed his love toward us, and while we were yet a harlot, prostitute, a horrible dad, a cheater, living in a sin of any sort, having an addiction, struggling with porn, losing my kids, lost respect of everybody that I have. And yet, why, why I was so messed up, God died for you in the middle of that. You know why? Because in our minds, we think, well, if I straighten up or I try to earn God's grace, if I come to him and I do better, because that is our mind. Let me tell you, the lost deal with spiritual warfare that they have to somehow earn salvation or earn God's favor. You can never earn it. Now, for a lot of us, we're like, amen, that is true. But do you realize for the lost, the reason why some people won't even come to this building is because they don't think they're good enough. The Bible says, <clears throat> not by works. Not by works. Not by the things you do, the good behavior, overcoming an addiction, overcoming your past, overcoming your sin, it's not by your good works. It's not by works of righteousness, of doing the right things, which we have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us. The whole point of that passage is the fact that you think that you have to earn it or straighten yourself up. <clears throat> if anybody's watching online and you're thinking, one day I'll get to church or I'll get saved or I'll get right or I'll, I'll try to make my life right. When I get things in order, God's the one that gets things in order. 
The reason why we struggle so much is because we're made of flesh and our flesh fails over and over and over again. You can never earn God's place in your life. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace is when God gave you something that you don't deserve for the spiritual warfare that is breaking out in anybody's mind that I cannot change, God cannot change me, people rip me off. I want you to know that God's grace, God's love steps in when everybody else writes you off. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is the work of God. This is basic for some, but I'm telling you, it's spiritual warfare for others. And I know for anybody sitting here going, I know this, I know this, I know this. Praise God, you know this. I'm talking the one on line right now or the one sitting here right now that you came in here with your head dropped because you're thinking that God's just done with you and God is not. If God can save a prostitute living in a pagan city, God can save you sitting in Fellowship Baptist Church right now. And she said unto them, listen, listen, what's going through her mind? Have you ever thought what's going through the mind of people that are lost? Because in our mind, we think what's going through their mind is, I don't care, and God's not real, and I don't, uh, you know, all these things go through our mind. I'm not going to talk to them one more time. They've written off God. They don't care what I have to say. They ignore everything that I say. <clears throat> and she said, she's having this conversation. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is falling upon us. And that the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And as soon as we heard these things, <clears throat> it says that our hearts did melt. Neither was there any, remained any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, even the God of heaven and <clears throat> the earth beneath. Let me show you this. She was, she was not only living in sin, she was broken. Can I, can I just show you some of the things that she's thinking, the process of what she's thinking? She wasn't thinking seeing the church. And you say, it wasn't the church. Work with me on this. She didn't see the guy at work that goes to church every week or the lady, the, the, the neighborhood lady that is so faithful to brag on Jesus and plays Christmas, uh, Christian music in her car. She's not thinking as, that, that as they were coming forward, as the religious people were coming forward, she's just thinking, I am a mess. I am messed up. Nobody loves me. I'm going to receive the wrath of God because that's what I deserve because I, I don't know their God, but if that God did know me, he would write me off. And the whole mindset that she had was she said, our hearts didn't melt. She said, I felt for the terror has fallen upon you. You know what terror is? It's dread. It's fear. It means to tremble. Do you know how often people come in this room thinking that they will never be accepted? I don't dress like them. I don't act like them. I, 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 have, I have a past. I have addictions. I have, I have kids that I, in, in ways that I shouldn't have. I, I have, I, 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 the list goes on and on. She had this, the Bible says that she, she has, our, our courage is melted. There's no more courage in any man. Literally on the inside of them, she felt hopeless. She knew she was not good enough and it scared her to death of our God. So why would anybody be free of God? Because they don't know him. Jericho's story is more than walls dropping, but about God saving an outcast. Do you notice when we get to Hebrews 11, it's not even about the things that we make this story about. God begins to make it all about the one person that needed him and wanted him. God dropped hope into their life, and it wasn't an accident. So can I preach this whole thing a second time, but from another perspective? Because we know Rahab, she's the harlot. She lives in this house. She, she's messed up. She's terrified. She's scared to death. She's living in her sin. She doesn't know how to get out of her sin. She has this reputation. And we say that God changed her and that God did. Okay, God changed her. We know that even from the New Testament, that God changed her. But the big question is how? And I, I think this is so powerful. This is so important for us to understand. You say, praise God, God can change anybody. But how does God change people? Have you ever wondered that? How does God do that? So God sent two people into the city. 
And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out these two men to spy out the land. Have you ever stopped to think about how cool that passage is of what that means? The word Joshua means Jehovah is God. It means Jehovah is salvation. So here's Joshua sending out these two men to go into a really messed up job situation. Or a very messed up family reunion. Or, 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 or a neighborhood where nobody loves God and they just play loud music all the time and they irritate you to death. And Joshua says, hey, go in there and figure out how to tear down the walls. Is that what happened? Nope, not at all. God already had a plan to tear down the walls. God said, go in there and represent Jesus. They didn't even know at the time that they were representing the blood that would be shed by the scarlet robe that she would hold down the side of the wall. But here it is. There's these two guys going in representing hope in the middle of somebody that felt hopeless here, here's the point. God delivers hope through us. Say so the world needs hope. Yes. Every one of us in this room and the people watching online right now, let me tell you, you are ambassadors of hope. Well, that feels good. It's like, yeah, I, I want to be that. That's what I... She couldn't get to them. And if she could, she didn't think she deserved to be there. And if she did, she thought that she would just be ripped apart because of her sin in her past. And God sends hope to her. And you know, not just sending hope to her, God sent hope into a horrible situation. That is why we have outreaches. That is why we care about people that are going through issues. That is why we have a recovery program. It's not because we want you to clean your life up. God steps into our messes. God cares about us in the state that we're in. God cares about that. This is cool. God set up a divine appointment. Have you ever thought, that girl's probably thinking, how in the world, wait, wait a minute. How did they find me out of everybody here? Because if I walked into that city, or nobody would sit there and say, I bet you she wants God in her life. She'd probably be the most least likely one in the whole place that you would want to talk and share about God. It's amazing how when we're walking in the spirit that God lines up appointments that you could never line up for yourself. It wasn't an accident. You know how I know it was an accident? She already shared what she was thinking. She already shared what was going through her mind. She said, the terror of the Lord. I knew this, and she was going through all these thoughts in her mind. God sets up divine appointments every day of our lives. Maybe we miss it. Ever thought to go by and say, well, let's avoid her. Is there people that we avoid? People that we think in our minds that they won't ever listen to us or they don't care, so we avoid those situations like that. Have you ever thought that even the doctor that you're sitting in the doctor's office could be a divine appointment for you to share truth? Have you ever thought that that neighbor that drives you crazy, that God put you next to that neighbor on purpose? The cubicle next to you, the, 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 the people that are in your lab that you share the, the ones that you carpool with, the job that nobody is there that loves God and they just drive you crazy and they hate the music you play at your desk? Have you ever thought that God said, I planned that out on purpose? It was intentional. It's amazing to me how many times I have met people for different weird situations about a totally different thing and how spiritual conversations open up and you say, what a coincidence. No, how awesome of a God. And I'll tell you, God has divine appointments set up even on Sunday mornings when we're here, but sometimes we miss it. People that come here that are looking and wondering, will I be accepted? Do I fit in? Do I don't know these songs? I don't know when to stand. I don't know what the, I don't know where Matthew is. I don't, you know, they, they don't know all these things. And then God has you come in and sit down right next to them. And then we're sitting on our phones or we're talking to somebody else or we get up to our friend group and you miss out on a divine appointment. We've got to open our eyes. She's in Hebrews. She's in the book of Matthew because of the divine appointment that people opened their eyes and said that, that we're here and God set it up, but you have to step into it. That's what faith is. Faith is not, man, they're so messed up, but faith is God can change anybody. That's what faith is. So whoever in your mind you're thinking would never be able to be changed, I promise you don't limit God. Faith is believing that God can change anybody, not just change them, but drastically change their life. 
Stop trying just to get through life and start living in a, as an ambassador of hope. Every day, just, you go in the world, I'm just going to get through the day. I'm just going to make it through. I'm just going to make it happen. You walk up to people that, you know, you're Christian. You just spent the day at church. They walk up to you at work and like, how you doing? I'm here, aren't I? <laughs> you guys know what I'm talking about. You know the people I'm talking about? The question is, are you one of those people that I'm talking about? Man, where's the hope that lies within you? The work is so hard. They put so much on us in the Christmas season. Where now we're working so hard. But let me tell you, you have an opportunity to make Jesus the reason for the season through your attitude. Through everything that you do. When, when, when your, your, your faith should be contagious. Your attitude should be contagious. Man, we've had some hard times through Logan's journey. And I feel like a broken record. This, this coming Wednesday, this coming Wednesday will be two years since Logan's failed surgery, not since he's been diagnosed, two years since his surgery failed, December 6th. At the beginning of our journey, he, he had one round of chemo, and then we went home, and it was a really long week, two, two three weeks that we spent in the hospital the first time, and then he had the, the, the really hard chemo, and then we went home, and then we were going back to the hospital. And that, that second time when we went back in, we kept putting the monitor on his finger, and it kept reading that his heart rate was bumping over 200, and it was, it was weird. And then we'd do it again, and it was really low, and we didn't know what was going on. So we went into the hospital, and while he was in the hospital, uh, they, they were checking his vitals, and the, the lady checked it one, two, three times, and she started freaking out. And she said, I'll be right back. And three people walked in the room simultaneously, and we're like, is everything okay? Then they, then they started pushing buttons, and, and 12 people came into the room. And they were like, Logan, do you feel okay? Is everything okay? And that's when he went into AFib and his heart rate was spiking and all these crazy things were happening. And they ordered ice bags and they began to cover Logan with ice bags trying to get his heart rate and different things that they were doing. And in the middle of that, and I know a lot of you guys have heard the story, in the middle of that, they ended up calling for a crash cart. That freaked me out a little bit. They hooked him up to a crash cart. And they put the pads on him and all this other stuff. And I'm like, <gasps> you know, like whatever. And I remember me and Jenny's just sitting over there texting people. And we were praying. We were just asking God. I, 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 was, I was scared to death. I was scared to death. When they, when you're, when they can't get it in the rooms full of all these things. And, and it was just terrible. Well, he ended up going down to the ICU. And they ended up shocking his heart twice and doing all these things. And then we had crazy nights in the, in the cardiac ICU. It was, it was a really bad time. Really hard time. Really hard time. A few weeks ago, I encountered somebody. They were asking me how Logan was doing, so I was telling them the story. And while they were telling the story, I, I said, man, we've been through a lot. They said, well, I know about his heart thing and everything that happened like that. I said, yeah, we posted it. They said, no, my mom was one of the nurses in the room that day. I said, what? Yeah, my mom was one of your nurses. She was watching you guys. I had no idea who was watching me as I was going through a hard time. Because the thing is, we're good at singing the songs and wearing God is good t-shirts. We're good at showing up the building when things are good and we're going through times that are God, they're blessing and things are happening. But can I rewind to last week? What do you do when you hit the Red Sea? And you want to give up and say, you know what? We would be better off if we would have just died in Egypt. I would have rather just died in Egypt. Then they turn around and the army is running towards them. And God steps in and says, I know you're scared. I, I, I want you to stop and see. That's what we learned last week. Remember, stop and see. Just watch what God is going to do. Hold your peace because the plan that I have for you is to move forward because I've got more for you. Stop and see. But in the middle of that, you're not like, praise God from me. I mean, you're not just, you're just don't do that. You are a little weird, okay? But fear is real and it overcomes you. And they're just like, okay. And sometimes you just walk into the split sea as you see the enemy coming behind you because you're just obeying God and you're walking by faith even though you're scared to death. But the crazy thing is you never know in that moment who is watching you. Because the thing that changed this woman's heart the thing that turned all of this aside is verse 10 when she said, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea when you came out of Egypt. She says, I know your story. Did you know that that's what changed Rahab's heart? 
Did you know that's what made her know that there's a real living God? Not, not, not because she read something, because she heard something about people that went through a really hard time. And she said, I know that you went forward and I know you made it to the other side. And she said, we all talk about what God did in your life. Your pain could be a setup for somebody in the future getting to know Jesus Christ. Because the world is watching us right now. And I promise you, that's difficult. But the world is watching us right now. And they're looking for something real. You know what they want more than anything? They don't care about your cute posts. They don't care about the memes that you share. They want to see you when you're going through a hard time, how you still remain faithful. When you're going through a hard time, how you still show up in church. They want to see when you're going through a hard time that God is the real deal no matter what you're facing. Because God is not a fad. He doesn't just go through the motions. People aren't looking for something that is spiritual hype they're looking for something real she turns around and says i saw something real in you they're watching and as soon as we had heard these things our hearts had melt neither did any remain any uh, more courage in any man because of you but notice the rest of the verse for the lord your god is the god in heaven your God is the real deal because I saw it with my eyes. I've heard it with my ears. You are a testimony that God is real. Amen. They want real. I want real. I so desperately want my kids to see the God I preach about. I so desperately want to see the hand of God work but I promise you it will never happen unless dad keeps moving forward and Jenny keeps moving forward and Jordan and Logan and Morgan keep walking by faith, even though it's scary and even though it doesn't make sense because it's not just about me. It could be about the Rahab walking in the distance that thinks that God's given up on her for her to look at us and say, wow, that is the real thing. God is real. God is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The point of the story is God can change anyone. Notice this, what it did in her life. I love this. Watch this. You talk about the change. How did she end up going from being Rahab the harlot to Rahab the hero in the New Testament when she's in the hero, the line, the hero of faith, the hall of faith in Hebrews 11? Now, therefore, I pray you swear unto me. Swear unto me by the Lord. Since I have showed you kindness and will also show the kindness in thy father's house and give them a true token, and that you will save me alive and my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all of them that have delivered you out from the lives of death. She, she turned around and said, this is, this is literally what she's saying. She's, I, I can imagine she's like, I'm a harlot. I'm a harlot. What am I doing? What, are, what am I even asking? Okay. Can I have what you have? Will your God save me? And I know I'm messed up. I'm so messed up. And I know, I mean, she's, she's literally saying this in, a, in like a brothel. She's literally saying this in this hotel for sex. A messed up, disgusting situation. But I promise you, I don't care how messed up your situation is. By faith, listen, it was by faith. Well, your God changed my life. There's two parts of this that I want you to get. Number one, don't write anybody off. First of all, your faith inspires other faith. Their faith to walk through the Red Sea inspired Rahab's faith that God could change her. But whoever's here today, I want you to know that God, by faith, can completely change your life. Jump down to verse Hebrews 11, verse 31. He says in, in verse 18, he says, when we come into the land, he said, I want you to take this scarlet robe. Just take it and lay it down the window. When we see the scarlet robe, when we walk around, you will be saved in your house. Now, let, let me ask you guys, what, what did that do? Nothing. I mean, I, mean, I mean, physically speaking, all it was was a simple act of obedience. I don't know what this scarlet, scarlet robe could do as she's met with her family and said, it's like, well, how is the God of Israel going to save us? She goes, oh, watch this. Well, what did that do? I don't know. God just told me to do it. Verse 31, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not 
You know, another way to put that is by faith, Rahab the harlot perished not because she believed. She believed. Do you know how God will change your life? Simple steps of obedience. So if you're one here today and you have it in your mind, God's done with me, God can't change me, God doesn't care, I have tried a thousand times, I have so messed up, I am at the deep end, I am Rahab the harlot living in that hotel, deceiving and ruining lives, and God says, watch what I can do, by simply Rahab just takes steps of faith of obedience. Faith is believing that God can completely change your life, but for the rest of us, remember this, faith is believing that God can change anyone. For that person that you've taken off your prayer list, that, that relative, that brother-in-law, the sister-in-law, whoever it is, don't write them off because the power of God is greater than their past. The power of God is greater than their addiction. The power of God will set up divine appointments out of nowhere. The, the power of God will reach them and save them in their sin. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, we get to this point where it's application. So what did Rahab do? Rahab simply, listen to this, all Rahab did was obey. For anybody, and I, I, I talk to the people online, I talk to the people in here, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not what you do, it's a simple act of obedience. For some of you that say, Pastor Tony, if you knew how messed up I am, I know Jesus, but I am so messed up. I promise you, by faith, God can completely change your life. Go ahead and sit. Go ahead and stay in that spot. Because without steps of faith, you won't experience works of God. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. I know this is not a traditional setting. But the same God that works in that auditorium is the same God that will work in Fellowship Hall that will still reach into wherever you're sitting, in your car or whatever, and God will work because it's with the heart. It's not with your actions. It's not the things. It's with the heart. So right now, from your heart, if you're not saved, simply pray and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I've messed up. I know I'm far from you. I know I don't deserve this, but I ask you to come into my life and to save me. And God will. Say, how? By faith. By faith. It's trusting from your heart. And I think the rest of us, by faith, we need to start realizing that God's not done with America and God's not done with the neighbor and God's not done with your kids and God's not done with you. But by faith, we've got to rise up to reach those that are in a mess. God, I pray, Lord, that you'll take over this time and use it and bless it and help us. Lord, we want to honor and glorify you with our lives. We want to honor and glorify you through steps of faith. And God, I pray, Lord, for those that are struggling right now, that you'll reach into their life and help them to understand that if they stay where they're at, they'll stay where they're at. But when they start to take steps towards you of obedience and trust, you can completely change our lives. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And this is the part of the service that we call an invitation. I'm inviting you to experience it. The Bible says in Hebrews 11.31 that she received what the spies had with peace. Literally, I want what you have. If you're here today and you're struggling, maybe it's like you don't feel like that you can change, man, come pray with me. Come pray with one of us. I've got a team of people ready to, to meet you and to pray with you. But just listen to the words of this song as we sing. Some of you need to sing and some of you need to just simply respond. But let's sing together. This is as simple, as simple as it gets. This is what God has.
in a time like this, but the Spirit of God is not limited to a place or a location or an invitation song. As I walk into Connecting Point after the service, maybe some of you are just something on your heart and mind that you're going through. You're just like, man, I don't, I don't know if I could ever change. Don't leave here without stopping in to talk to one of us. We've got the next steps table out in the lobby. Everything that we do is kind of in another place, whatever, but it's still the same mission still the same God, and God is working. I just don't want you to ever think that God's done with you. I never want you to think that you're too far gone. If God can reach into a walled city to reach a girl that thinks she's unreachable and unchangeable and can radically change your life, when we get to Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, the name Rahab is there. It's tied into the story of Boaz part of the lineage of the story of Jesus Christ. Then God's done with me. He'll save me, but he'll put me on a shelf. No, God will save you and radically change your life. He's just that great of a God. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Lord, for your goodness, your blessing. Lord, thank you, Lord, for what you taught us and you continue to teach us. Lord, help those, Lord, that are struggling in their mind right now. Those that think that they're far gone and, and Lord, they're unreachable or Lord, that you've given up on them or if they've tried and tried and tried, Lord, you, I don't care if it's the third time we've cried out to you or the 50th time, you're still always there because you're faithful when we are not. Lord, bless us as we go our separate ways in a minute and Lord, just help us to fall in love with you as we take steps of faith, Lord, to an almighty God. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated doing something fun this morning. Uh, Ileana, come on up here. Uh, we are adding to our church family today. Uh, this is Ileana Eads. If you haven't had the chance to meet her, uh, I remember a few years ago, uh, Ileana, we were, we were having real life, our student ministry back in the more, the the memorial garden like directly behind us and I remember Ileana coming with her dad and she introduced herself they had just moved to the area she was coming to the church she was super involved in our youth ministry for years uh, serving in in the worship team doing all these different things and now she's on her own she's going to college she's involved in Catalyst and today she's joining the church officially so we're super proud of Ileana 
And if you if you haven't had uh, the opportunity to meet her, make sure you get a chance to meet her. Uh, thank you, Ileana. Let's give it up for her one more time. You can have a seat. I have uh, just a few things, a few other things I'd like to tell you about. Uh, but first thing is this. If you don't have the Church Center app, that's a great tool for you. And everything else that I'm about to tell you, uh, you can find more information for it within the Church Center app. Uh, if you're a guest with us, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we're honored that you would choose to be here on a Sunday morning. It seriously does mean the world to us. And uh, if you have any prayer requests or anything, please submit those. Uh, we meet on a weekly basis to pray over those things, and we would love to do that for you. Uh, we'd also love the chance to meet you and to get to know you some. Uh, Connecting Point is a room right across from this building, just over across the hallway, room 102. Uh, Connecting Point is there, and that's just a chance for us to get to meet you face-to-face. -face. Uh, Pastor Tony, some of our other leadership will be over there, and we would love the chance to, to say hello, to meet you there. Uh, if you have a question as far as you just don't know what your next step in your faith is, in your journey with God. You don't. You just don't know what the next thing is. Uh, there's a table out here in the lobby. It's got a big banner there that says next steps. And it is for people like you who have questions about what your next step is. Uh, they're there to answer those questions for you. So if that's you, please go see them at the next, ta next steps table. Uh, they'd be more than happy to help you out there. Uh, next week, uh, during the first service, starting at 9 a.m., uh, we have starting point. And so uh, if you are, are looking to become a member of the church or maybe you're just, you're just trying to figure out what Fellowship Baptist Church is, why we do the things we do, how we do the things we do, starting point is a class that answers all of those questions for you. Uh, so you can come to that during the 9 a.m. or at 9 a.m. during the first service and then attend here in the second service. So we'd love to have you do that if you're interested. Again, all that information is there in the church center app and then uh, if you are interested and in you're if you're a lady and you are interested in going on a mission trip to guatemala there's an interest meeting next week next week that's next sunday after this second service immediately afterwards again all that information can be found in the church center app uh, and this is not you giving a hard commitment that you're going to go to guatemala but it is you saying, hey, I'm, I'm interested. You're going to find out some more information. And so if that's you, if you're a lady and you're interested in that, please come next week. Sign up on the Church Center app so that we know that you're coming and can communicate everything to you. Um, and then Sunday or Christmas Eve this year is on a Sunday. So Sunday, December 24th is Christmas Eve, and we're excited uh, about that Christmas Eve service. And here's what it's going to look like on that day. We're going to have two services in the morning like we normally do at 9, 15, and 11. And we would just love for you to invite your friends, invite your family, invite your neighbors to come and be a part of that day. That's, that's a day where some people who would maybe not be willing to go to church may be willing to go to church on a Christmas Eve service. So we just ask that, that you invite people to come to be here and to enjoy that sweet time uh, of, of a service uh, together with us. Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, it's been a great day in church, and I hope you have a safe trip home. You are dismissed.